I've heard it stated before that the Atlantic slave trade was an interruption of African history, and I thought that was an interesting way of thinking about it. This idea has some credence, because many of the African ethnic groups taken in the trade of human beings came from various cultures and civilizations. Moreover, there was a brain drain of African peoples that likely robbed local regions of future growth and the potential for economic or political stability. So today, we're going to be speaking about some of the top African ethnic groups taken in the Atlantic slave trade and their civilizations. <laughs> What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. The link to Patreon is in the description box below. Also, stay tuned with a word from my sponsors. Hello, my name is Howard Dorsey. I'm 54 years old. I'm here to talk about my uh, experience with herbal results. Um, I was getting sick, so I, I went to the doctor and they told me that um, my blood pressure was high, my cholesterol was borderline or high, so I was very sick. You know, I thought I was, sometimes I thought I was dying at, at some point. And uh, I ordered a bottle of olive leaf extract. This is, this is how the bottle comes in. And within the first probably week and a half, two weeks, I checked my blood pressure and it was back down to normal. It was like 120 over 80. And my cholesterol went down to uh, 125. You know, I definitely believe that olive leaf extract from herbal results saved my life. And I, that's real. I mean, I, 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 and I recommend it to everyone in my family, my friends, and we've seen a lot of results in that, in that manner as well. Purchase now at herbalresults.net. To begin, it's important to understand that the African ethnic groups mentioned in this video are just a guesstimate concerning the frequency in which they were enslaved in the Americas and the Caribbean. There is no conclusive list that orders their number in comparison to others. The ethnic groups you will be hearing about today in regards to their frequency are opinion based. You'll get different answers depending on who you speak with. Also, most of the ethnic groups on this list are both victims and victimizers. This history is more complex than what's traditionally presented in popular culture, so please keep this context in mind. All that being said, in the comments section below, feel free to share some of the ethnic groups you feel were the most numerous in the Americas and the Caribbean. Unfortunately, the Atlantic slave trade was among the youngest of the human trades on the continent. The much older giants were the Arab slave trade in Eastern Africa and the Trans-Saharan slave trade in Northern Africa. The trade in human beings across the Sahara and Eastern Africa, for the most part, enslaved a different pool of African peoples. However, you'll find that the Atlantic and Trans-Saharan slave trades often intersect in regards to the ethnic groups trafficked. One of the most numerous groups enslaved in both trades were the various Mande peoples. The Mande peoples consist of Africans that speak the Mande languages. Keep in mind that this is the only peoples on this list that will be broadened into a language group. We'll get more specific later. Perhaps the most popular Mande groups are the Mandinka, Soninka, Bambara, the Susu, and others. Many Mande groups were traded within Africa via the older Trans-Saharan trade. During the reign of Malay Ismail in Morocco, many Mande-speaking groups, in particular the Bambara, undoubtedly became conscripted in the vast Moroccan army helping to provide stability to a fragmented Moroccan state during the 17th century. In fact, the Sultan's mother may have been a Mande woman herself, and even though her specific ethnic group cannot be confirmed, the pool of Africans she was taken from was certainly below the Sahara. The most popular Mande groups like the Soninka and the Mandinka built the first and perhaps the most powerful states in West African history, the Wagadu and Mali empires. Wagadu, also known as Ghana in the literature, was championed for being extremely wealthy and having twin towns or cities in some descriptions. Mali was internationally known for its learning and trading center at Timbuktu. Scholars, doctors, teachers, and imams were all flocking to Timbuktu during the apotheosis of Mandinka civilization in the 14th century. 
Another group similarly enslaved in both the Trans-Saharan and Atlantic trades were the Fulani. The Fulani are a very interesting group because historically they are the only Africans that can be found in both Eastern, Western, and Central Africa. Thus, as you can imagine, they were undoubtedly caught up in human trafficking. The origins of the Fulani are debated. In general, they are popularly known as cattle keepers, but many of them have adopted agricultural or urban livelihoods. Most Fulani have either been on the fringes of other African empires or have directly contributed to their growth and development. With the influence of Islam, the Fulani began to create their own states. The most famous and powerful of the Fulani theocracies, however, was the Sokoto Caliphate of present-day northern Nigeria. This vast empire rose as the result of a jihad led by a Fulani cleric, Usman Danfodio, against the Hausa states during the early 19th century. Soon thereafter, a Fulani theocracy established control in the Messina region. Another principal African ethnic group caught up in the Atlantic slave trade was the Yoruba. The Yoruba became so numerous that they heavily influenced Afro-Brazilian culture. One of the places Yoruba religion was preserved best was in Bahia, Brazil. Adherents of the Yoruba-influenced religion of Candomblé worship Yoruba deities and mix Yoruba spiritualism with Catholicism. Yoruba city-states such as Eleife and Oyo became the centers of Yoruba civilization first developing around the 11th and 12th centuries. Remnants of Yoruba civilization take the form of the world-renowned Eleife sculptures. Testament to the skill and mastery of metallurgy was how this Yoruba civilization created cast of nearly pure copper, a feat that artists of ancient Greece and Rome, the Italian Renaissance, and Chinese bronze casters never achieved. Our final African ethnic group taken in the Atlantic slave trade was the Mbundu people. According to oral tradition, the Mbundu apparently originated from three different African groups who migrated to northern Angola in the 15th century. They brought with them iron making, agriculture, and a belief in divine kingship. The Mbundu began to create kingdoms, Ndongo perhaps being the most powerful. By 1500, the Ndongo monarchy with its capital at Kabasa was the largest and most prosperous of the kingdoms, built on a mixed economy of agriculture, artisanry, and trade. Queen Nzinga was the central figure of Mbundu statehood, becoming the most recognizable African queen of the 17th century. Through the chaos of the Atlantic slave trade, many Mbundu were captured in the process, arriving in Brazil. This video is really just scratching the surface of the civilization and material culture of these African peoples. Discussion of this aspect of African history is important because it's a reminder that these people were not just aimless wanderers waiting to be captured. They were people who formed states with high culture, developing socio-political structures unassailably on par with the rest of the world. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help in its continued development, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.